are universal for everybody, but faith makes it specific. That's why, uh, that's why it says that whosoever, when it says whosoever, that is a word meaning the individual. Whosoever believeth in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. That's why we preach the gospel. Did you ever think about that? If God just picks and chooses who's saved and just does it all on his own that way, and faith plays no part, then there's no need to preach to anybody. I mean, let's just be blunt about it. If that's how it is, then why preach? Why bother sending out missionaries? Why go anywhere? But the reason we preach to people, why do we do that? To tell them what's done. To tell them what Jesus has done. So that whoever, whosoever believes, you know, in Him. Now, what does it mean to believe in Him? I had this conversation not long ago out of BJCC. Some uh, young man uh, was... I've had, I've had all kinds of disputes and... I don't like to argue. I don't want to argue. Um, I'd rather just say what, what I say, and everybody else is free to say it another way if they see it another way. Uh, but then people, if they don't agree, they want to fight and, and argue about it. And, and so this young man, and again, it amazes me, all the expert theologians <laughs> to find it. <laughs> anyway, he said, well, now, I, I don't know. What, what you're saying sounds so strange, he said, because that's not the way I was brought up in church. <laughs> And I hate to be blunt about it, but, but the way you're brought up in church doesn't decide everything. It's what it says in here. And, I, and I, he said, well, if what you're saying is true, then everybody is saved. And I said, no, that's not what I'm saying. John 3, 16, I quoted it just like I quoted to you. For God so loved the world. That's universal. But then it says that whosoever believes in him. Well, then he said, uh, what does it mean to believe in him? And I said, well, you tell me. What do you think it means to believe? Well, it means you've got to surrender your life. I said, well, you know, if that's what it meant, he should have put that in there. But that's, what, that's what we say in church, you know. You ever been in church very much? You hear that a lot in church. I, not for me. <laughs> I, I, I meant to do it last week. I forgot to do it. I was going to do a word search. I've got it on the computer. I could easily do it. And type in the word surrender. I just, just as I think through my mind, I can't think of any place where that word even appears in the New Testament. Can anybody think of one? Or, and I know that message is not there. He doesn't say that you surrender your own. But that's what we say sometimes. To believe means to transfer your confidence from yourself to Him so that you're not trusting in yourself or relying on yourself. You're relying on Him. But that's what faith is. That's what, the, that's what it means to believe. But that's important. See, that is, that's the deciding factor uh, when it comes down to who gets to experience what God... See, God wants everybody to be blessed. I think. I just believe that. I believe He's good. I believe he wants me to be blessed. I believe he wants you to be blessed. I believe he wants everybody to be blessed. You know, in the ministry of Jesus, uh, Peter described it this way after the fact in, in Acts chapter 10 when he was preaching at the house of Cornelius. Peter said, uh, he said, you know, he was getting ready to preach the gospel. He says, you know, this thing that God did through Jesus, it wasn't done in secret. Everybody, I, I, I think you all have heard about it already. But in case you haven't, he says, it's like this, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, he says. And that's the way he described the ministry of Jesus. And that's what happened. God anointed Jesus with the power, with the Holy Ghost and power, Peter said. What kind of power? Power for what? For blessing. And who was it for? Well, you know, read the Gospels. Just read it. Just see if Jesus went around. And say, no, I'll take you, but I won't take you. You read about him preaching, and multitudes came. And it says time and again, he healed them all. Now you'd think in a big multitude of people, there'd be all kinds of different sorts of people. Right? Wouldn't you think that? And you read time and again, he healed them all. He healed, but what you read when you get down to specific individuals is things like that woman with the issue of blood, who she said, I will touch his clothes. She got that in her mind somehow, if you know, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. That's what she said. She, she chose to, she decided that. She decided, I will touch his clothes and I will be healed. So she came and touched his clothes. And that power with which he was anointed flowed out to her because she used her faith to reach out to him. But see, her faith didn't reach out and make anything happen. It just received. It reached out to receive. And I think that's where the... Uh, and, and how do I know it was her faith? Because Jesus turned to her when he found out who, he said, who touched my clothes? And the disciples said, everybody's touching you. And that's another point. Why didn't that power flow out to everybody? 
because only one person believed in it and reached out by faith to receive from him. And he finally, she admitted that what she had done, and he said, uh, you know, be of good cheer your faith, he said. Your faith has made you whole, Jesus said. Your faith has made you whole. Now, why did he say that? Why didn't he say this, this power, this power that I have, has reached down and made you whole. He, he, the power did come out from him, but he said, it's your faith because that's what reached out and received it, you see. And that tells me that it's not a matter of the power and getting to Jesus, it's a matter of my faith, because now that power is freely available everywhere. Did you know that, by the way? That you don't have to go to Tulsa to find the power. <laughs> or Jerusalem, or, or anywhere. Uh, how do you? How do I know that? Because I read Acts chapter two. In Acts chapter two, you know what happened? In Acts chapter two, they were gathered in the upper room, and the Holy Ghost came upon them. And then Peter, see, this is another example how God can use those He wants to use when He wants to use. And Peter got up and preached a really powerful message. And in that message, he quoted from Joel, and he said this. And when he said this, he meant that that was going on right then in Acts chapter 2. This is that. He said, this is it, which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He said that in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Is that what he said? Did I quote that right? Now in the ministry of Jesus, the Holy Spirit was confined to one person, to Jesus. He was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. And that woman that needed something from God had to get to Jesus and she came and touched his clothes. But something changed in Acts chapter 2. See, the, here's another important factor about it. You ready for something wild? You ready for something shocking? that will fly against all your religious uh, assumptions? The reason the Holy Ghost was confined to one individual is because there was only one individual in, during the ministry of Jesus with which the Holy Spirit could be compatible. Because Jesus was the only one clean and holy and pure to house the Holy Spirit. But you know what happened in Acts chapter 2? It said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days I'll pour out my Spirit on all flesh. On all flesh. And again, not just particular ones. And I know people are used specially for certain kinds of ministry. I'm not denying that. But he says, on all, that means it's available for everybody. Well now, what about uh, the fact about how Jesus was the only person uh, with the Holy Spirit during his ministry? I said that's the only, that was the only place clean and pure enough for the Holy Spirit to be. It's because Jesus on the cross took away the sins of humanity. And now every, they don't know it yet. <laughs> that's why we've got to preach to them. That's why we have to, they don't know it yet. But to see, uh, again, I, I'm jumping all over the place here, and I, I'm trying to, I want to get back to this balance of grace and faith, but what prompted, what led Peter to that, Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10 was he was on the housetop uh, uh, in prayer before the meal and he fell into a trance and God showed him a sheet uh, full of all kinds of animals, both clean and unclean. And he said to Peter, rise Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, oh no, not so Lord, nothing common or unclean has ever touched my lips. I guess he thought God was trying to trick him or test him, put him to the test, see if he would violate the the food laws, because the food laws in the Old Testament made a distinction between clean and unclean animals. So Peter said, I'm not going to do it. You can't trick me. Uh, nothing clean, unclean has ever touched my lips. And so he, uh, three times God showed him the sheep, clean and unclean animals. Rise, Peter, kill it, eat. And then finally God said, Call not common or unclean that which I have cleansed. That's what he said. That was the message of that little vision. Do not call any more unclean that which I have cleansed. Now, was this all about food? Was this all about animals? Is God going to all this link just to make a little lesson about some animals, about, about changing the food laws? No, because at that very moment there was a knock on the door. That's my sound effects. It's a, <laughs> we get sound effects here. Uh, that's my sound effect of the people knocking on the door. It was Gentiles knocking on the door because the Jews considered the Gentiles unclean and unfit for God's work and to be a part of God's covenant. That's what he meant when he told Peter, do not call common or unclean that which I have cleansed. He's saying, go with these Gentiles and preach to them about Jesus because I've cleansed them. Don't call common or unclean that which I have cleansed. So when did he cleanse them? On the cross, when Jesus took away their sins. Now here's a remarkable fact. He cleansed them, but they didn't know it yet. They didn't know it until Peter came and told them about it. 